מברזילי לדבר על התעוררות פרנסטית וכולי מדיון על פי. Argentinian flag. She put it on quote because I think she don't know what she's talking about. 
and uh, she recommended do preventive preventive measurements. So she's you know she's really nice oncologist. She's worried about her patients, and please take care of her. Okay, so we're taking care of her. Okay. So in summary, until this and uh, until now. We have a 47 years old lady, stage 4 epithelial growth uh, factor receptor mutation, the resistant kind of the lung cancer, under experimental treatment with the first drug, rosiletinib, okay, and switched to the second drug that, uh, because of uh, resistance, which developed uh, both eyes cataract in two percent on the left. She was admitted for urgent death type factor and uh, after she developed the tubularity. Now to understand the meds, uh, overall and pharmacodynamics of, of her case, uh, I just want to do a quick review of her disease. Non-small cell, cell carcinoma uh, represents 85% of all the lung cancers. 30-35% are nice enough to be localized and be able to be resected surgically. Okay? Either way, 50% of these cases are going to eventually end up in systemic treatment. And 80% of all the patients end up doing chem uh, chemotherapy at some point. And so this can tell, tell us how often we can receive a patient with lung cancer that is most likely under some kind of chem uh, chemotherapy. What's the proposed effect on the lens? There is nothing published specifically about these cases and this is the best I can do with the information available. First of all, I will just uh, make a quick review of the anatomy and uh, how the lens behave. Um, we have to remember that we have a migration of the cells of the lens coming from the um, equ uh, equator of the lens to the posterior pole the cells go under, under differentiation, they go out of their normal cell cycle, They're, they lose a lot of organelles and they create the crystalline, that is the, the protein that gives the transparency property of the lens. And this ha happens on the way from the, uh, from the uh, equator of the lens to the posterior pole. And now, what is she taking? The first one, rosiletinib, it's a, both of them are irreversible inhibitors of epidermal, uh, epidermal growth factor receptor. Both of them are still under uh, research. And the difference is that the second one that developed, being developed by AstraZeneca, it's, it's more specific to the kind of cancer that it's already very resistant to the mutation of the, of the receptor. So it's one of the last stands that are being developed by Simon. Okay. Uh, now, talking about the homeostasis effect of these drugs, the block of these receptors, um, we can find the most amount of the receptors on the most prol proliferative uh, area of the lens, which is the equator, as I said. And the growth uh, can be inhibited by inactive, by blocking the uh, normal work of the uh, endothelial, um, um, uh, sorry, the, the normal uh, input and output of the calcium inside the cell. Okay, so you create a stasis of calcium intracellular. And we know, or it's been already noticed, that the rise of intracellular precalcium induces protolysis of the nucleus, and uh, as a direct effect, it makes you cell and night cataract. This is the uh, oxidative stress induced cataract. And these are very rapidly developed. Now, about the structure. Also, the blockage of this receptor changes the inner structure of the, of the lens. So you lose the property of the elongation that they acquire as they travel posteriorly. And um, so, so you lose the structure and the transparency of the lens. Now, what did I say? So we have a lot of receptors on this side of the lens. 
And when you plot them as they travel to the posterior fold, you have a lot of effects. Increased free calcium, nuclear proteolysis, loss of inner structure, and slowing down of the cells. And this gives you a cataract. Theoretically. Okay. Now, at this stage, I just jumped for surgery, and Dr. Schwann, the did the revision of my presentations, told me, you know, that's a very swift change from the lens epithelial cells theory to the surgical risk. So you need to make something fun, you know, like put something. And I really take seriously advice of my senior uh, doctor. So now on the fun side, on the fun stuff, or something. Like that. Uh, what are the surgical risks of approaching these cataracts? We know that. Uh, these kind of cataracts, extumescent cataracts, are very, uh, have a very high uh, intracapsular pressure, okay, anteriorly and posteriorly. So uh, when we approach and we do calpsulorexis, if we're not careful enough, we're going to end up with Argentinian flag, that is elongation of the capsulorexis to the side because of the uh, great inner pressure, okay, of the, the lens. There are a couple of uh, techniques described and published already. The first one in 2010 by Argentinian doctors, of course, and the second one by Brazilian doctors. Uh, about how to approach these, they each have their own specifications. This is the approach that we have in the patient. So, apply vision glue under air. They recommend under some physical aspect. Um, do like a soft shell technique, dispersive under cohesive or self-dispersive. Um, use a needle to puncture and decompress by aspiration the material inside the lens. Re-inject uh, helon 5, this is what we use, to keep the pressure in the anterior chamber pushing down and avoiding the Argentinian flag effect and uh, perform the capsulorexis with forceps because it gives us uh, the best control. So, we brought you three minutes of video. And this is just to make a clear example of the steps that we did. This is the uh, vision blue on their um, we did it under air, I forgot to put it here, but we did it under air, now we're filling them through a chamber uh, with a soft, soft shell technique and, uh, to, to make as much pressure that contrasts the inner pressure of the capsule. Uh, after that, um, we start with the capsular exit with the forceps. Now, if you remember, uh, first you have to decompress the the by aspiration, okay? There's a lot of loose material inside that is part of what's making the inner pressure of the lens. Uh, but still, you see, it's, it, it's very fragile and the pressure is so high that even if you're really careful, it will tend to, to rupture the capsule. So you refill as many times as needed the entire capsule with helium-5 in this case to, to keep the pressure high in the interior chamber, pushing back. And then just do a very, very controlled and very, very careful capsulorexis. And you have to remember that vision glue makes a very fragile uh, capsule. So any small movement can be catastrophic in these cases. Now, there's a good thing on these uh, entumescent cataracts. These are not very hard cataracts. Sometimes you're lucky enough to be able to just aspirate. So this is what we actually did on this case. You will see that we didn't do any faculty. We just aspirated all the material. And so this is on the bright side. And and as you can see, it's a very loose and there is no need to, to do hydro dissection because it's actually floating on its own melted uh, material of the lens. So 
So this is just a demonstration of how um, easy it is just to um, do aspiration and the material will, uh, will go and flow by itself. And as you can see, <coughs> um, the last step is to do uh, lens insertion on the uh, a very stable capsule. Okay. So we fill it up all again with uh, uh, eight on five, and then we did the insertion of the lens. Long-term effects in, in other regions of the body, 
due to uh, antibodies. The main antibodies that were associated with it are the uh, aquaporin antibodies. Now, aquaporin is the hormone that, uh, that deals with the, uh, you know, the, the cellular aspect of how to handle water. And uh, intimidating with uh, uh, aquaporin is uh, uh, usually associated with swelling of cells. We know there's aquaporin in the trabecular mesh of the canal, for instance. And you know, uh, sometimes swelling of those cells can cause glaucoma on its own. So my uh, proposal to you would be that maybe, maybe uh, this, uh, this is a paraneoplastic uh, uh, disease with antibodies to aquaporin. And it's worthwhile testing. It can be tested, I think, I don't know if in Tel Shomer, you know that, if we have aquaporin antibodies. But now that in Oxford, England, and in two centers or three centers in the US, you can, you can look for it. Just an extra comment about that. I went also to the morphology and the development of the history of this special case, and that's why I chose this cousin and cataract. And if you are over the literature of the different, you know, secondary due to effect of something related that they're looking about some other treatments, so then I cataracts have, have a very, you know, on the same line, the timeline, and even even the, the look of the cataract itself, and you see the photographs of their cases, there are mouse uh, cataracts, but they look really the same. Pearly effect, very swollen, and very rapid development. As I said, this, this is the best I could find. Surely there will be a lot of explanations, but uh, maybe with time, these are very new drugs, so we have to see and expect what, what the literature is saying. Yes. What this suggests is that the epithelial cells, less epithelial cells, may be dependent on EGFR for their actual substance, subsistence, and once you give this special drug, Apparently, they, they go into apoptosis, and there you get you have it. The fact that this is not the first case or the only case with this kind of very complications means that there is probably a direct effect of the drug. Yeah, I, as, as, as I was going deep on this case, I was finding uh, a lot of things in the eye are very if it is a real factor receptor dependent, we were checking a, a case of a PBR also. And we know it's also EGFR dependent from the uh, pigmented epithelium. So, if anyone is interested, maybe it's online of research. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.